Okay, my name is Sue Guise. I'm the horticulture educator here at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Jefferson County. I've been here about 20 years. And I just wanted to let everybody know that um, we have door prizes for today's program. Um, three lucky winners are going to receive a packet of five different vegetable seeds. And um, what we'll do at the end is we'll have a little drawing for that. I've got everybody's name in a little basket here. And um, at the end, we'll have a drawing and people can then let me know how they want to receive their seeds. But we'll do that at the end. So let's jump right in and get started with the program. Um, a lot of people tell me that they can't grow anything, that, oh, I don't have a green thumb, I have a brown thumb. Well, the, the bottom line is that brown thumbs do not exist. Um, and today we're gonna turn you into a green thumb. Um, a lot of times um, people get discouraged because they, they try growing something and it doesn't go well. And that happens. Um, you're not going to get 100% beautiful things every year. I've been gardening for almost 40 years and every year I have something that does not do well and most of the time I do not know why it did not do well. Last year it was cucumbers. Um, I do a lot of canning and preserving. I canned four jars of cucumbers. That's how badly my cucumbers did and supposedly I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. So don't get discouraged. Gardening comes with practice, but it is not difficult. And that's the thing that I want to emphasize. Anybody can do this. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to home gardening. Um, first of all, food security. And with the advent of COVID, um, there has been a huge uptick in the interest of growing your own food, whether it's vegetables or fruit. Um, as you remember, a year ago, this time when COVID began, you know, a lot of grocery stores were running out of things and people became concerned. And um, as a result, a lot of people started their own gardens and we're seeing the same trend this year. A lot of interest in home gardening. Um, when you garden at home, you can grow vegetables that are fresh and organic. You know what you've added to that garden. And if you're an organic gardener and you don't like to use pesticides, you know that, that those fruits or vegetables have not been treated with anything. You know your inputs. And that's kind of the beauty of home gardening. And there's nothing fresher than, you know, five o'clock, you're making dinner, you go out to the garden and you pick whatever is out there and immediately go in and cook it. Um, you can't get anything any fresher than that. Um, you can save money. Um, by growing your own foods. And it's also free exercise. I do not go to the gym in the summertime because I'm gardening and I get plenty of exercise. The biggest piece of advice I can give beginners is to start small. The biggest mistake that people make is they you know, plow up a huge area and they're gonna plant lots of food and you know this is what's gonna happen and they're gonna be very successful and it's great. I'm, I'm glad that people are enthusiastic in that way, but it can become overwhelming very, very quickly. So for most people, I suggest that you start with a 10 by 10 area. 10 by 10, you can grow a lot of stuff, even have items left over for preserving. And if you have you know, family, uh, 20 by 20 is ideal for a family of five. Um, when, when my kids were still at home, that was about the size of the garden I had. And um, I, I lived in a village. I didn't have a lot of space. So 20 by 20 ended up being perfect. And I had lots left over for preserving. And here's, you know, just kind of a, a 20 by 20 garden, just to show you um, all the things that you could, could grow um, in that size garden. That is not, not a small garden. And once things begin growing and you need to weed and you need to take care of things, um, something larger than that may be a little bit overwhelming. Um, a good way to start small is with raised beds. These are garden beds that are on top of the ground. And um, 
you can do a lot of different things with them. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but th that's kind of a way um, to, to start small, just give yourself, um, you know, a, a limited size to begin with, and then you can go from there. And here's, here's an example of some raised beds. Um, you know, the, the one that you see in the forefront here is probably the perfect size to start with. And you also can garden in containers. Um, a lot of people don't have yard space, don't have space to, to dig up their lawn and put a garden in the ground. So container gardening works very, very well. And you can get a lot of produce um, out of containers. And most vegetables will grow well in containers. Um, the only thing you need to do is if you're gonna grow in containers is look, look for varieties of vegetables that are labeled either compact or bush. And that means they don't get really big and they, they do better in container type gardens. Uh, very easy for beginners. You can start with you know, three or four containers and see how it goes. Um, one benefit of container gardening is that you really have fewer weed issues. The weeding is very easy to keep up with. Um, Containers may require more water. You're probably gonna have to maybe water them every day in the summertime. Um, that's because they're above the ground and the sun is probably shining on them. So they're gonna be more subject to drying. They're portable. So if you are in a situation where you don't really have a lot of sun um, for a long period throughout the day, you can move the containers around to follow the sun. And the easiest way to con do container gardening is with five gallon buckets. Um, oftentimes you can get them free. If you go to your local grocery store, um, a grocery store that maybe has a bakery in it, um, oftentimes they buy their frosting in five gallon buckets and they are more than happy to give those away. And also you can, you know, buy them for a couple dollars at, you know, the various big box stores. The bottom line is anything can be a container, anything that can hold some soil. Um, it should be light in color because the sun is going to be shining on it. And if it's a dark color, um, it can get really hot inside of that bucket and, and affect the roots, basically cook the roots. So try to, try to stay with lighter colors. And the biggest thing you need to keep in mind with containers is to make sure there are drainage holes in the bottom. The water needs to drain freely um, when you irrigate. If it doesn't drain out and water will collect on the bottom and that's gonna lead to problems like root rot and fungal diseases, all kinds of nasty stuff. So with five gallon buckets, basically just get a drill and drill five or six holes in the bottom and that should be adequate. Um, and then you fill your containers with ProMix or another type of a soilless mix that you can find at most big box stores. Now there's a reason why we don't um, just go outside and dig up some soil and fill up the buckets. Um, soil that's outdoors is very heavy and if you want your buckets to be portable um, by the time you fill them with with native soil so to speak they're going to be too heavy to move around and, and then if they get um, and if you water them they're going to become even heavier. So that's why we recommend that you fill them with pro mix. It's a soilless mix, very light in weight. And most plants are gonna do well with that with just a little bit of fertilization. As a gardener, you're also going to have to start paying attention to the weather because the weather is gonna have an effect on everything that you do. Um, you really need to know when your spring and fall frosts occur um, because a lot of times there are some things you can't plant because of um, cold temperatures. Some plants just do not do well if they are exposed to frosts. And the same thing goes in the fall. You know, you may have lingering tomatoes on your tomato plants and they may call for a frost. Well, if you can bring those green tomatoes in, you can ripen them inside. Um, as long as you know that you're going to get a frost. Um, if you don't know and you go out there the next day, those tomatoes are not going to be worth anything. Um, another thing you need to pay attention to is rainfall, because um, if you get adequate rainfall, you're probably not going to have to irrigate. 
And um, a lot of times once the plants get wet and they stay wet for a period of time that can lead to disease and you don't wanna be watering on top of that. So pay attention to the rainfall. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about watering and irrigation. And um, high winds are also a uh, problem um, that it seems to me that in recent years, almost every other day they're, they've been calling for, for high winds. I don't remember that when I was a younger person, but um, a lot of times if we're gonna have high winds, you kind of need to know about it. Oftentimes you can you know, stake or tie up your plants so that they don't get damaged. So paying attention to the weather is important. So let's get started. And here's just a, a nice example of some raised beds. And this would, like I said, this would be the perfect size to begin with. It looks like they've, they've got tomatoes, peppers, some basil, some herbs, maybe some lettuce, um, a ready-made garden right there. So let's talk about um, locating your garden. And, and, and in relation to garden location, we're gonna talk about a few different things. We're gonna talk about gardening directly in the ground versus gardening in raised beds. We're gonna talk about how much sunlight you need, what the site conditions should be like. You know, is it level? What's the soil like? What's the general environment like? Do you have access to water? This may seem obvious, but it's something you need to think about. And also, you know, if you, Think you're going to like this, you probably should do some planning so that you can expand in future years. So first of all, let's talk about growing in the ground versus growing in raised beds. Now, growing in the ground is going to be the cheapest option, but it's, it's probably going to be more work. Um, if you have the space, um, it's, it's going to be the easiest thing to do because you've already got the soil there. You don't have to add soil. And you know, here's a simple thing, um, just three beds. As you notice, they've got paths between the beds and those paths are wide enough to mow. So you can go right down through with a lawnmower um, or you could you know, till up the whole area. You don't necessarily need those gra grassy paths in the center. Um, raised beds. Um, Raised beds need to be built out of a rot resistant material. And there are um, types of treated lumber out there now that are okay. They're supposedly okay for like children's play sets and okay for gardening. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, um, what we recommend is either black locust, white oak or white cedar woods and a lot of these can be sourced from the Amish. Um, we bought some nice um, white oak um, wood to make raised beds for our, for our mission garden that we have. And um, we got those right from the Amish. Now, the, the issue that makes raised beds expensive is not only do you have to build them, but you also have to fill them with soil. Um, and th that can be quite expensive. Um, as far as what do you use for soil? Well, you've got a couple of options. You can go to your local garden center and just buy bag soil and fill it up. It's gonna take a lot. Um, you can get bagged what they call topsoil or you can order a truckload of topsoil. Now, the reason I say the word topsoil in quotes is because usually um, what we know is topsoil is not what is gonna be delivered to your house. Usually these companies that, that deal in topsoil, it's usually soil that's collected from a building site. It's not that rich, earthy, uh, neutral type soil that um, we want in our garden. So if you're going to uh, have a load of soil delivered, uh, number one, it's gonna be expensive. Number two, um, you usually have to buy a large quantity of it for it to be worth your while. But just know that, you know, if you can at least get the pH of that soil tested um, beforehand, that would be helpful. And, and we can do pH testing right at Cooperative Extension. So raised beds are excellent 
in areas where you have maybe soil that's very poor, if you're on a site where the, where the ground may be contaminated by something, um, those are when you wanna use raised beds. Also, if you have a, if you're on a location where there is very little soil, where rock is right near the surface, and let's face it, there are a lot of areas in Jefferson County that are like that. Um, I gardened in the village of Dexter for 25 years and my yard was mostly rock. There was really only one location that I could put my garden directly in the ground um, because there was so much rock at the surface. Um, and raised beds are also good for people with limitations, people in wheelchairs, people who can't bend over. They're an excellent option. And there are a lot of ways to make them decorative. Um, and we'll look at some of those. Um, here's just some real simple raised beds, probably made out of uh, two by tens or two by twelves. Very simple to build. Here's a little something a little bit more elaborate. Um, really fancy stuff. If you know somebody who's a carpenter, um, you can you can make these really nice decorative options. Here's an option for somebody who who perhaps can't bend over, can't get down on the ground to work nice um, raised uh, gardening bed that's easy to access. And here's, a, here's another you know, cheaper option. You can, you, you can make raised beds out of pallets and we all know how often we see perfectly good pallets laying alongside of the road. And this is just a simple thing that was built out of pallets. And then you've got kits that you can buy also um, to use for raised beds, a little bit more expensive. But you know, if, if you if you want, you know, you have certain standards in your yard and you want things to look super fancy, there's that option also. So next, as far as placement goes, let's talk a little bit about how much sunlight you need for a vegetable garden. The first thing you need to know is kind of think about where you might want to put the garden, you know, where you've got the space, where you've got the soil depth, or, or where you would like to put your raised beds and evaluate the sun's path. Um, what location offers the most sun? Are locations being shaded by trees or are they being shaded by buildings? And just kind of watch and go for that spot that has the most sunlight. So you need at least eight hours a day for the vegetables that are listed. These are vegetables that require a lot of sunlight and, and eight, eight hours would be the minimum, you know, 10, 12 is gonna be better. And then if you have maybe a location that's a little bit shady, doesn't get as much sun throughout the day, things like carrots, beets, Swiss chard, kale and mustard greens, they will tolerate um, a little less sunlight and still do well. And then for areas that don't get a lot of sun, um, you can plant spinach, arugula, and lettuce. Um, actually, these crops, they actually like a little bit of shade and a little bit of cool temperatures. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And if your only option is a southern slope at your location, um, it's going to be kind of difficult to garden on a slope. I don't recommend it for beginners, but if that's your only option, um, you can tier it. Um, and that, that's a little bit more work. But just keep in mind that southern facing slopes are going to require more water. Okay, so now we come to that whole slope thing. Um, to make your life easy, keep the garden as level as possible. Um, if, you, if your only option is to work on a slope, it needs to be terraced. And here's a couple of examples. These are kind of elaborate options for terracing. But if you don't terrace it, um, the wa everything's just going to run away. You're going to have a lot of erosion. Um, your, your seeds are going to erode. Possibly your plants are going to go downhill. So if you're going to garden on a slope, you need to have a plan for terracing. Know which way your prevailing winds come from. Usually in this part of the country, it's the west, either the northwest or the southwest. If you are gardening on a hilltop, it's probably going to be windier and um, it, plants are probably gonna require more water because the wind is going to dry them out more quickly. Let me just go through my notes here. 
Okay, so as far as water goes, um, your vegetable garden is going to do the best if you can irrigate. Um, in the past, we used to be able to rely on mother nature to water our vegetable gardens, but in recent years, the last decade or so, mother nature has become very fickle. And we tend to have pretty good drought periods during the summer. So for best results, you, you really need to irrigate. So as a result, you need to have access to water, either a spigot, a hose, or some type of sprinkler or drip irrigation system. Um, drip irrigation is the best way to irrigate because the water goes directly into the ground, directly to the plant roots. You have no evaporation. But let's face it, um, drip irrigation costs money. You have to buy hoses, you have to buy special um, hookups for them. So for most of us, the only option is a sprinkler or a hose, and that's perfectly fine. Um, you may use a little bit more water using a sprinkler because you're gonna get more evaporation. The last thing that you want to do is to be in a location where you have to haul water to the plants. Um, that gets old very, very quickly. So try to think of how you're going to keep this garden irrigated. So let's talk a little bit about siting that garden in relation to trees. Um, if you put your garden um, in a location where there are tree roots, that those roots are gonna be in competition with your vegetables. And tree roots go very, very far away from the tree. Most people think that the roots stop where the canopy ends. They don't. They go two to three times beyond the width of, of the canopy. So if you can try to place your garden away from those tree roots to avoid any type of competition for water, for nutrients. And obviously if there's a tree there, there's gonna be competition for sunlight because you may have some shading going on. Again, that's why it's important to evaluate the sun's path. I also wanna just give a quick note about black walnut trees. In this part of the country, um, black walnut is a native tree and a lot of people have them growing naturally in their yards. Um, the problem with black walnut is that it releases a toxin into the soil, which prevents many plants from growing. Um, it's a, what we call an allelopathic toxin. And all parts of black walnut contain that toxin. It's not toxic to people. It's only toxic to other plants. So it's found in the roots, it's found in the leaves and the nuts and the stems and everything. And if you try to grow tomatoes specifically or potatoes in an area where there are black walnut trees, they, they'll die. Uh, they'll grow fine for a while, but as soon as they encounter that toxin, they will start to wilt and die back. So if you have black walnut trees and there's no way to avoid that root zone, you're probably going to have to put in raised beds. So let's talk a little bit about expansion. Um, you know, just, just have a plan. Um, obviously, you're going to start small until you know, you know, if you like doing this. And um, if you do like it, then you have some options for expansion. So you can either add more raised beds or make the garden in the ground larger. Okay, so that's, um, that's the end of that section. Does anybody have any questions? And you can either unmute yourself or you can put your questions in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna take a look. Okay, go I ahead. Have a question. Okay, um, when you were talking about the Amish and the woods, mm -hmm. you didn't mention hemlock. I understand that hemlock, it's mainly in Canada and I live in Messina in St. Lawrence County, but they say hemlock will not rot and it's uh, a good material and it's really cheap. 
Yeah. Very inexpensive. Yeah. The, the reason the reason it's it's not as rot resistant is the ones that I men mentioned, the locust and the white oak, but it is high up on that okay. scale. So it would be it would be fine to use that because it's um, it's going to last you for a number of years. You know, the reason we we don't recommend just going out and buying, you know, non treated two by fours is they're going to last maybe four years and they're going to rot. and You're going to have to start all over again. Um, right. So, um, so hemlock, yes, it would be fine. And hemlock is a native tree um, throughout Northern New York. Um, so okay. th there's a lot of it available locally too. I would check with the Amish. That's where I got mine. Okay, good. So let's see here. Um, and anybody other have any other questions? I'm just gonna go through the chat here. Um, let me just read people's comments. Uh, Logan said cucumbers, peas, and beans didn't do well here last year, but the tomatoes were crazy. I, I would tend to agree with that. I, I think we, we had a lot of heat last summer and tomatoes love that. I had wonderful tomatoes also. Um, uh, Dave says, seems windier to me too. And we had a windstorm last night. Yes, I, I heard the wind howling last night. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to do a garden in my area because my husband and I bought a house that's, oh, the yard floods severely. So yeah, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna have to solve that drainage problem, maybe put some drain tile in or something like that before you can plant in the ground. But you know, for now, um, containers, raised beds, probably containers are gonna be your best option. Let's see, do you need to be a certain distance from septic tanks? Um, yes, I would completely stay away from the leach field um, because you don't know what's coming out of that and you don't want um, to grow vegetables on top of it. Um, in theory, what comes out of the leach field is supposed to be okay, but you know that depends on you know what kind of septic system it is and how old it is, but I would avoid anything um, probably at least 100 feet from a leach field. Let's see here. Um, what about picking up cow or horse manure from farmers? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but yes, absolutely. Um, a lot of times farmers are more than willing to, to get rid of cow manure. And as long as you, um, you know, have a truck or, so, or trailer or some way to transport it, it's, it's usually a very um, inexpensive option. Okay, let's see here. Um, here's a note from Logan about soaker hoses. They were $12 for 50 foot at Tractor Supply, which, which, is, which is a good price. Um, and soaker, like, like I said, ho soaker hoses work very well um, as far as preserving water and make, making sure that water goes directly into the soil. Um, I used them for a few years, but it, it to me, it just got to be kind of a pain in the neck to lay them out and to get them straight and to store them. And, you know, I did it for a few years, but after a while, I just kind of gave up on it. Um, is there any way to sort of guess how far your trees will root out if you want to plant fruit trees? So I, I guess the question is, is how far away um, should a garden be from fruit trees? Well, I would say, I mean, fruit trees are not going to get really big. I would say as long as you're 20 feet away, you probably should be fine. Uh, and they also ask if you have land, there's a lot of sit sitting water. Is there a way to drain it without expensive lawn work? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's a question for an engineer, actually. There are ways to to drain wet areas, but you know you're talking about somebody coming in with a backhoe and putting in drain tile. Um, if it's um, a small area of flooding, you can probably deal with it yourself. Um, you could probably divert that water just by by digging a French drain or something like that. Um, but it, it I guess my answer is it depends on the situation. There are ways to mediate that, but um, if it's a huge area of flooding, it's it's going to be it's going to be an engineering job basically. Do you need to put a bottom or flooring on a raised bed? Um, that's a good question. 
And that's a question that I get. And I don't think I, um, you know, I think I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but I'll answer it right now is no, you don't need to put a barrier on the bottom unless you are dealing with contaminated soil. Because if your raised bed is, you know, say you use two by eights, maybe it's eight inches deep. Um, by the time you put the soil in there, nothing is going to, you know, that's currently in the ground, any weeds are not going to come up through eight inches of soil. So um, unless you're on contaminated ground, you don't need to worry about that. Um, yeah, so yes, yeah, so if, if you did have to put a barrier in, yes, you would need to put holes in it so the water can drain out so you don't get that buildup of water. Are city residents allowed to correct rain, rain water or redirect gray water? That is a good question. I don't know um, what the city of Watertown allows. I would call the city planning office and speak with them. Um, what's the best place to get bulk compost around here? That is a question I get very, very often. And if somebody can tell me where you can buy bulk compost, I would love to know. Um, you used to be able to get it, but I believe the company that sold the bulk, bulk compost now only sells it in, in bagged quantities. Um, and if anybody is interested in getting into the business of building compost and selling it, I think that would be a wonderful business because this is a question I get dozens and dozens of times a year. Um, and if, if you have any, have any ideas, please let me know. Um, I live in the middle of a village and we already had an issue with the tree branching into our home piping. So I don't want to have them get into village piping. Do you have any companion tips? for plant, planting raised beds. I'm gonna talk about companion planting a little bit shortly. So we'll, we'll hold on for that. Um, no, rabbits. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk about critters also shortly. You guys, are, you guys are way ahead of me. Okay, I think that is all the questions that were in the chat anyway. So we're gonna, uh, let's see. Okay, here's from Don. Um, can Oswego County Extension in Mexico do soil testing? Yes, they should be able to do it. Um, most extension offices um, do offer soil testing. And I'll talk about what we offer here in Jefferson County shortly. Um, anyone in the Syracuse area, Ramondo Topsoil sells um, compost. Okay. And I know in, Sy in the Syracuse area, um, the um, the place where they where they burn compost, I believe they offer compost too. But up here in Jefferson County, I don't know of anything. Uh, I live in the Catskills, and we have a farmer in town who leaves piles of compost out with a little cash box. You can pull up to your truck. That's great. That's great. Um, I wish we had more of that around here. Uh, okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to our second section, which is about soil preparation. Okay, so if you are gardening in a raised bed, and you know, the same thing kind of goes with, with containers also, um, fill it with topsoil mixed with peat moss, compost, it, compost or composted manure. And I just wanna point out the word composted manure. You never want to use fresh manure um, because it contains a lot of pathogens. Um, if your only option is fresh manure, you need to apply it in the fall. Then it has all winter to break down, incorporate into the soil, and um, you know it, it's not as hot, and, and the pathogens will will not be as nasty. But if you are preparing your soil in the spring, you really need to use composted manure. And if you get manure from a farmer, they know exactly where the nice old aged composted manure is. You know, they'll tell you, you know, go to the bottom of that pile over there. And that's where you want to want to get that manure from. You never want to use manure from carnivores. So 
dog poop, the cat litter box should never be put into a garden. Believe me, um, people have asked me that. Um, um, manure from carnivores contains a lot of pathogens and so you don't wanna use that. But if you have a guinea pig or rabbits or alpacas or sheep, um, chickens, anything that is a vegetarian, it's, it's perfectly fine to use that manure. Um, and we talked about this, do you need a barrier? No, um, unless you're working on contaminated soil. And then you're just gonna rake the bed to level and let it settle. Um, you know, do, do this a couple weeks before you plan to, to start planting things because that, that soil, it, you know, you've got it, you've added it in there, it's all kind of fluffy and it's gonna settle, it's gonna settle. So, so allow that to happen. And you may find that you may have to add a little bit more topsoil. Um, I found that last year. I, um, I was gardening in the ground, but for a lot of reasons, we ended up putting our, moving our garden into raised beds. And um, we actually had a truckload of topsoil delivered, huge truckload. And once we put it in, by the end of the season, it had settled, dropped, you know, maybe four or five inches. And so this year now I've got to add more soil. So if you're gardening in the ground, um, the one thing you really should try to do is remove the sod. So if you're gardening in an area that has lawn or grass on it, you need to cut that sod off and get it out of there. And the reason for that is because if you just go in and till the thing up, dig it up and incorporate, that grassy material into the soil, what's gonna happen is you're gonna end up with a nitrogen deficiency because as that green sod material breaks down, it's gonna use up nitrogen in the soil. Um, if it's your only option, you know, removing sod is hard work. Believe me, I've done it. Um, and you know, for a lot of people, it's not an option. If your only option is to incorporate the sod into the soil, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Okay, ideally you should remove the sod. And then you're gonna to wanna to hand dig that soil or till um, in a four inch layer of some sort of organic matter, either peat moss, compost or composted manure. So you're gonna uh, till or hand dig that into a depth of about 10 inches, which is about, about a shovel depth should be good. Um, and that, that four inch layer is only for the first year. In subsequent years, you only need to add a two inch layer. Um, everybody knows that adding organic matter to the soil is a good thing, but you can overdo it. And if you add too much, you will create a problem called nutrient overload which is very, very difficult to reverse. So don't go crazy on the organic matter. Four inches to begin with and two inches in subsequent years. And then you're just gonna you know, rake that area to level and let it settle and then you can start planting. Now, the biggest question we get is, you know, when can I start doing this? When can I prepare my soil? Well, up here in Northern New York, it's usually not a temperature issue. We're, we're not usually waiting for the temperatures to warm up before we can plant. Um, we are usually waiting for the ground to thaw and the ground to dry out. Those are the biggest things that hinder us in the spring. Um, as long as your soil is dry, um, um, you, can, you can start planting as early as mid-April. Some, some crops can go in, some seeded crops can go in as early as mid-April, as long as your soil is dried out. That doesn't usually happen. Um, usually, sometimes it's into May before we can start things because we're waiting for that soil to dry out. So how do you know um, if your soil is dry enough? The best thing to do is to go out there and just to take a handful of soil and squeeze it in your hand. And if you squeeze it and there's water running down your arm, that soil is too wet. If you squeeze it and you open your hand and that soil stays together in a clod, still 
too wet. If you squeeze that soil and you open your hand and it falls apart, or as you touch the soil, it kind of crumbles, then you're good to go. So don't be too anxious to, to start working because if you work wet soil, it can destroy the soil structure. Um, and that again is another situation that is very, very difficult to reverse. So just give it a few days. Usually in the spring, all it takes is maybe three or four days of sunshine and a nice breeze and that soil will be good to go. So I can't stress that enough. Um, in this country, we have abused our soils horribly. And in the last 20 years, we've begun to realize, whoops, what we've done in the past wasn't the best way to do things. And um, now we're, we're kind of reworking a lot of those things that we recommended in the past. Okay, so there are a couple things you should know about your soil just real basic things. You should know what your soil texture is like, and you should know your soil pH. Now, soil texture refers to the amount of sand, silt, and clay in your soils. Um, the, the holy grail of soils is loam. This is what we're all going for. And some people have loamy soils naturally on their site. No, they're lucky. But most of us, you know, we may have a soil that's really sandy. We may have a hard clay soil. And you need to know this because these soils have certain characteristics. They're going to affect how you garden. For example, sandy soils are very dry. So you're going to be watering a lot more. Uh, clay soils are very hard. And if they dry out, it's really difficult to re-wet them. So you kind of need to know your soil texture. And all you need to do is bring a sample in to Cooperative Extension and we can take a look at it and tell you what the texture is like. There are also soil maps. Um, you can get online, you can put in your address and it'll bring up um, a map of your property and basically tell you what kind of soil you have on your site. And if you're interested in doing that, all you need to do is contact me and I can, I can hook you up with a website. Um, one of them is through the USDA. It's called the USDA Web soil survey. Uh, and there's also one through UC Davis in California. Um, your pH, that is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of your soil. And the pH scale is a logarithmic scale. It runs from 1 to 14. Um, most of the soils in northern New York are in, within this range between about 6.5 to 7.2. Um, a pH of one is like battery acid. You're not gonna see a soil with a pH of one. pH of 14 is like bleach. You're not gonna see a soil um, with a pH of 14. Most of the soils in this country, they kind of, kind of are in this range. And here in Jefferson County, we tend to be right in the sweet spot um, pH of, you know, between six and seven is what most plants like, and that's what our soil pHs tend to run. And the reason we pay attention to this is because at that sweet spot there, that pH between six, five, and seven, two, that's when nutrients are available to the plants in the amounts that plants need, okay? Sometimes if you have a lower pH, you can run into toxicities of nutrients or deficiencies of nutrients. And the same goes towards the alkalinity, uh, towards the alkaline or basic side, you can run into toxicities. Um, here in Jefferson County, you don't, don't be worried about your pH because it's usually fine. We can test your pH at Cooperative Extension. All you need to do is bring in a sample of the soil from the site. Um, take about five or six random samples on, on, on your site, go down about eight inches, mix all of those random sam samples together and bring us in about two cups and we can test your pH. And once you know your pH, th then you know It'll give you the confidence to know that your soil is probably okay. And never add anything to your soil that's going to change your pH, something like limestone, 
Um, don't add anything like that until you know what your baseline pH is. Um, a lot of um, gardening books, gardening magazines recommend add limestone every year. We don't have to do that here in Northern New York because our soils are already towards the neutral range and pH, uh, limestone will raise your pH. And what happens when people listen to these blanket recommendations that are fine for other parts of the US, but not fine for here, is their soil starts creeping up. Their soil pH creeps up and it's towards eight. And they bring me in soil and they say, none of my plants are growing, something's not right. And it's usually because they've added limestone or wood ash. So any of you who have wood stoves, do not put that wood ash into the garden. Um, if we were in New England, where they have very acid soils, that wood ash would be great. It would, it would help that soil, but not here in Northern New York. So the bottom line is know your pH, your baseline pH. Like I said, we can do it for free. And then you know where you stand. So um, you want to keep your soil healthy. Um, your plants are growing in the soil. That's the environment that they have to deal with. And if you don't keep your soil healthy, if you abuse your soil, it's going to be reflected in the crops that you grow. So you need to think of soil as a living community. It's filled with beneficial organisms that are involved in complex interactions. And this has a direct effect on your plants. Um, if you mess up the soil, it takes a long time to bring that soil back to a natural state. Um, so kind of just some things is avoid compaction, which means avoid working that soil when it's wet, even avoid walking on the soil when it's wet. Um, over tilling. This is another thing that I can't stress enough. You should only be tilling your garden once a year, either in the spring or the fall. Um, a lot of people use tillers as a weed um, a weeding mechanism. They till several times a year. Um, it's fun to have a machine, but you can over till your soil. And again, once you do that, it's very difficult to recover that soil to a healthy state. Um, and then again, you know, like I said, in subsequent years, add that two inches of organic matter each year, but don't go crazy because you can run into problems. So we will stop here for a moment. Does anybody have any questions about uh, soil preparation? I actually have another question. So, sure. Okay, I see these little mini rototillers. They're about four inches in diameter and people use them as weeding between the rows. So would you say you wouldn't recommend that? No. I. I I wouldn't. I, I, is it a is it a, a, a gas powered? powered? Gas mm -hmm. powered? Gas yeah. powered? Yeah, that's probably just going to be be too strong. Um, you know, if you have those little hand things that are on a on a, a pole that have spikes on them, that's fine. But okay. you know, this constant letting the weeds grow and then tilling them up um, over and over again that's it's not good for the soil. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, trying to find, okay, trying to find where we left off. Okay, um, my, my husband likes to bury fish guts in the garden. Is that okay? Yes, it is fine. You know, as long as, as, long as you're good with that, a lot of people might not be good with it. But that's what um, Native Americans used to do. They, when they planted their crops, they would throw a fish in there. Um, and there, there's a lot of nutrients in that. Um, and that's, that's absolutely fine to do. Um, just watch Kiss the Ground. Yes, Lisa, thank you for mentioning that. If any of you have Netflix, um, under documentaries, there is, a pro there is a program that was just released. It's called Kiss the Ground. And like Lisa says, it is very eye-opening about the importance of soil. Um, they discuss a lot of the things that I've already talked about and more. Um, 
It's narrated by Woody Harrelson, and don't let that turn you off. He, yes, he's an activist, but they don't get into politics. They just kind of tell you what's going on and, um, you know, basically how treating our soil correctly can solve a lot of our problems. So I would 100% recommend that. Uh, let's see here. I believe that my yard is clevy, heavy clay, not sure how to tell. Um, bring us in a sample or, or just give me a call and I'll direct you to the, um, the um, soil survey sites or I can look it up myself and, and kind of let you know. Um, I read Animal Vegetable Miracle a few years back. Okay, um, what she's referring to Animal, Animal Vegetable Miracle is a book um, that came out, oh gosh, probably about 15 years ago um, by Barbara Kingsolver. And it's basically, I haven't read it in probably 15 years, but it's basically um, this woman, and she's written a lot of other books. She tells her journey of how she got into gardening. Um, and it's, it's kind of an inspiring book. So thank you for the book recommendations. I'm always happy to discuss books. Um, can you repeat the soil collection testing procedure? And yes, Logan has repeated that, but I'll, I'll repeat it again. Just go to five or six different places within the planting area. Dig down eight inches, scoop out some soil, mix all of those samples together, and then bring in about two cups of that mixture. And then from there, we can do pH testing. And if needed, we can also do a complete soil analysis. Um, that's when we send your soil sample to a lab down in Ithaca and they basically tell us, you know, what, what the nutrient levels are and what you need to do to improve your soil to grow vegetables or tomatoes or apples or, or whatever. And the soil analysis only costs $15, one five dollars. So that, that's a bargain. And I recommend, you know, if, if you're really gonna get into vegetable gardening, or especially if you're gonna get into um, any type of perennial cropping, like fruit trees, things like that, you really should have that done. Okay. Um, okay, so, okay, so Logan is gonna test his soil. That's uh, okay. Yes, we have somebody who's got a wet area that also serves as the dog's um, bathroom location. Um, yeah, I would, I would try to keep the dogs out of that area if you're going to be gardening in that area because, you know, again, cats and dogs, they're, they're carnivores and, you know, we, you just don't know what's, what's in their feces. So for your own peace of mind and for health reasons, I would try to keep them away. Okay, someone says they have chickens. Um, they found chickens will scratch down a few inches. Um, so I guess, I guess they're trying to say that maybe the chickens are helping with soil prep, which they can do. Um, and also they're depositing their, their feces there and that's gonna get worked into the soil. You have to be careful with chicken manure because it does tend to be acidic. So if you're going to use chicken manure, you really need to make sure that it's well composted. Um, is there a good way to compost home garbage scraps to add to the soil? Well, I mean, the best way is to get a compost bin and st start doing your own composting. Um, and Cooperative Extension has a lot of information on that. Um, and when we say garbage, we never want to put garbage into a compost pile. Um, if you're going to start doing home composting, you should really only put four items in. First of all is yard waste, um, weeds that you've pulled, sticks, grass clippings. The second is kitchen waste. So anything from your kitchen that's from a fresh vegetable, no cooked vegetables, you know, vegetable peelings, the remains of, you know, a salad without dressing on it, you know, you're making a salad, you, you accumulate a lot of stuff, potato peelings, apple peelings, things like that, but nothing cooked because cooked products have butter and spices on them. Eggshells are the only other thing and coffee grounds and tea bags. And you can include the tea bag itself and the filter that the coffee grounds are in. So only four things should go into your compost. Once you start putting in things that have butter on them 
oils, fat, grease, meat, things like that, that's when you run into problems with compost. And um, that's why people don't like compost. They're, a lot of people are afraid of it because if you add the wrong stuff, it's going to smell and it's going to attract critters. So stick with those four things. A, a, a compost bin should never, you'd never want to scrape the dinner plates in it or anything like that. So as long as you stick with those four items, you should be good. And I'm sorry I went on about that, but um, let's see. Susan, I got a question. Okay, yes, go ahead. I watched some gardening shows and uh, one of them was a guy up here in this uh, type of region. He put plastic over the soil and let it sit for a couple of weeks to kill bacteria and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're doing container gardening and using the, the bag soil and stuff was something we don't have to worry about, correct? Right, you shouldn't have to worry about it. What, what he was doing is called solarization. And there's a lot of reasons you might do that. Um, you can you can put either clear or black plastic over the soil and let it cook for a few weeks. And what that does is it basically kills a lot of the weed seeds. Um, it stimulates the weeds to grow really fast and then it gets so hot that it kills them. So that eliminates a lot of the weed seeds that are at the surface. So that, that's one reason for doing it. And another reason is, is to warm up the soil, especially if you've got a raised bed where you're above the ground on that soil maybe a little bit cold, longer to warm up. Um, and and that, that's one reason why you would do it. So there are reasons for doing it, but um, you know, I don't know what kind of bacteria he's trying to kill. I'm kind of wondering <laughs> what's he doing to his soil um, because soil is filled with viruses and bacteria and microorganisms and probably 95% of them are beneficial. They are necessary for plant growth. And we don't really want to kill those because they, they are a good thing. So um, I, I guess I'd have to see the video to see where that guy was coming from. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, Teresa says, would you add worms to eat directly to the soil? No, you don't. It, as long as there's no barrier in the bottom, they're going to move up into that soil. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother to do that. Um, how much soil should we plan on for 10 by 10 raised bed? Well, you'd have to do the math. You'd have to figure out what the volume of how many cubic feet um, was in that container. And then if you're getting soil delivered, um, you can, if you're going to, you know, a landscape company or a gravel company who's delivering soil, all you need to do is tell them the size of your bed and they'll, they'll bring the appropriate amount if they will bring a small amount. A lot of times they don't want to do that. They want to bring like one of these giant dump trucks full. Um, but you can figure it out, um, figure out the volume and then check on the side. If you're using a bagged product, just it'll tell you right in the bag how many cubic feet are in there. So um, I think if you get online, you can find that information pretty quickly is, is how to figure out volume. I've established an apple tree. It's being blocked out by other trees. Is there any way I can help it out? I would say, Rochelle, call me on that one. Um, I'll be in the office next week. Give me a call because there's a lot of questions I would have to ask you about that. And we can go from there. Um, it is horrible using so much plastic when buying. Yes, my local dump has recycling for agricultural plastics, but I'd like to avoid buying so many bags. Seems logical to kill the soil somewhere else where this plastic is being buried in the name of improving soil my yard. Any suggestions? Um, I agree. Um, I'm not, not a big fan. I try to avoid buying plastic, but it's almost impossible. Um, any suggestions? Well, if, if you're gardening directly in the ground, you know, that, that's going to be the best option because you don't have to buy soil. You don't have to have soil brought in. Um, and as long as you add organic matter, you shouldn't, you shouldn't need to add anything else. And adding organic matter year after year after year, eventually you're going to end up with a nice loamy soil. Um, if you are gardening in raised beds, gosh, I don't really have an answer for you um, how to avoid that. Um, 
you know, unless, unless you know somebody who's got some, some manure that you could supplement, but you have to be careful with that because you don't want to get too much manure in there. You'll end up with problems. So I, I guess, again, I'd have to ask you some more questions about your particular situation. So give me a call at the office and my contact information and my email is going to be at the end of this presentation. Um, okay. Can vegetable fruit scraps be added directly worked into the soil area that will be the garden? Yes. Um, this is what's called pocket composting, where you basically dig a little hole, throw your apple peelings in there, <coughs> and just let, let it do their thing. Um, it's called lazy man's composting. And I did this for years when I lived in Dexter. I didn't really have a place for... Um, a compost bin. So what I would do is when I, you know, had a collection of stuff, I'd save it up in a container and then just go do a little hole in my garden and bury it. And eventually, you know, mother nature, microorganisms, everything will, will break that material down and work it into the soil. You have to be careful if you do this while you have vegetables that um, actively growing because you don't want to obviously disturb the root systems. So this material needs to be added in a location where there, where there are not a lot of roots. Okay, um, Louise has put up um, a 10 foot by 10 foot. She's done the math for us as, um, and that's 3.7 cubic yards. So thank you, Louise. I'm glad that there was a engineer listening. Okay, are there any, let's see, um, uh, yeah, trench style, yes. Logan says yes, trench style is very similar to, to pocket gardening, the same same thing, um, and, and that's again just an easier way to compost. Okay, all right, so I think that were, that was all the questions. Um, okay, here's a tip from Elizabeth. Recycle your plastic bags into containers for tomato plants, etc. I do this with bags from my chicken feed. Okay, yes. Um, what I think I think what Elizabeth is referring to is you can take those plastic bags, um, probably even bags that you get bird seed in. They're made out of that plastic like woven material. Um, and you can actually fill those with soil and garden right in those. Um, you can either stand them up or lay them down, cut a slit in the top and put your plants in. And that, that, that's a good way to, to um, recycle those plastic bags and, and keep them out of the landfill for at least a little while. All righty. Okay, so let's move on to our next section about laying out your garden. Okay, so you really should kind of have a little plan or a little drawing of how you want to set up your garden, but you don't need to be a landscape architect. Now, a lot of people really get into this. If you are, you have some computer program where you can do this and you can do all kinds of really cool things like that, wonderful, I love it. Um, I, I don't have the patience to fool with that. Um, usually what my drawing looks like is something like this. And actually this is, this is beautiful compared to what I do. I basically draw a square, a square and write stuff on it. So kind of think about where you want to put things in your garden. And we're going to, I'm going to give you some tips shortly about how to place things, but um, just put together a very simple drawing and know that it's going to change. Um, you may get out there and you may start planting seeds and find out, oh, you know, I've got enough seeds for another row. And so you can, you can adjust things or maybe you don't have quite enough to finish your row, things like that. So, so, so be flexible, I guess is what I wanna say about that. Um, so there's different ways you can lay out your garden. You can lay them out um, in beds or in rows. And um, if you're going to, what a bed is, is basically a square area that's planted. Um, it's planted solidly with something. And when you're laying out beds or even rows, you need to follow what's called the two foot rule. 
And what the two foot rule ref refers to is that most people when they're working at the gar in the garden, they can only reach about two feet away from their bodies. So if you have a row or a bed that is um, that you can access on both sides, it should not be wider than four feet because the most you can reach to the center is two feet. If you have a, a bed that you can only access from one side, it should not be wider than two feet because that's about as far as you're gonna be able to reach. And this is important because you're gonna to need to weed and you're gonna to need to harvest. Um, so, and you, you know, when you're doing those things, you really don't wanna step in to where the plants are growing. So, so follow the two foot rule. And basically beds work good for dense plantings. So you can just kind of scatter the seeds and this works best for greens, um, things like spinach or lettuce um, that can grow very closely together and without a problem. Now you can't do it for everything. You certainly wouldn't want to, you know, scatter zucchini seeds or something like that. This is only good for um, those, those green type crops. Um, you can also plant your garden in rows because you can have a walkway between the rows and sometimes it's easier to access them. Um, you can do long or short rows, whatever works for you. Um, rows are good for root crops because again, with a root crop, you can't just scatter the seeds because the roots would all grow together. You need to um, plant the seeds singly or you need to thin the seeds. And if you're doing thinning, um, rows are probably going to be easier for you to work with. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of gardeners do a hybrid. They'll put um, a bed in that contains rows. But usually most people do a combination of both of those things. So as far as um, layout goes, how exactly to place those plants, let's talk about tall plants first. Um, you want to place the tall plants on the north and west sides of the garden, okay? Because you don't want those tall plants to shade the other plants. So if you have, if you're growing tomatoes, asparagus, climbing peas and beans that are on some sort of trellis, um, if, they're, if it's on the south side of the garden, it's going to shade everything that's behind it. So initially in your first year, I would put those, those kind of crops on the north and west sides of the garden. And you know, here's some examples. Now this is a whole field of asparagus, but as you can see, it, it gets pretty tall and it had, would have the potential of shading other plants. Tomatoes can get very big as can um, you know, vine crops like uh, pole beans and peas. Now, I talked about you don't want to shade out other crops, but there are crops that like shade. They benefit from it. Um, and as a result, if you're going to be growing a lot of these shade loving crops, maybe you could put your tomatoes on the south side and plant your shade loving crops in the shade of those tomatoes. Um, things like lettuce and spinach, they really prefer cool, um, a little bit shady conditions. And the reason for that is because lettuce and spinach will only grow for a short period of time and then they will go to seed. They are crops that like cool weather. And once, you know, we get around mid-July, it's just too hot for them. They say, we're done. You know, we're going to go to seed. The leaves become bitter. You can't eat them anymore. Um, so what you can do with these crops to extend that season is to give them some shade, um, give them a little cooler location and that will, then you can harvest them a little bit longer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about companion planting. And I think somebody, I think somebody mentioned that earlier. Um, there is a lot of information online about companion planting. And unfortunately, most of it is false. Um, back in, I believe it was the 1970s, um, a person did some research about soils and what plants could grow next to each other. I think it was called biodynamics or something like this. 
And it created this whole movement um, based on companion planting and based on the experiences of this one person. Um, unfortunately, the, these, these um, experiences were not research-based. They were not done in a scientific manner. And a lot of the information that they produced is incorrect. And unfortunately, because of the internet, it still persists out there. So, you know, when you read about companion planting, take it with a grain of salt. I'm going to tell you about what we do know about complaining about companion planting that, that is real, that is, that is factual. And it's basically add flowers to your garden. Flowers make great companions, especially if you're gonna be growing crops that need pollinators. So any of the vine crops, things like squash and cucumbers and zucchini, um, you need, they, are, they need to be pollinated by insects. So if you add flowers, they're going to draw on the insects, which are then going to um, help pollinate your crops. Um, the flowers that are most attractive to insects are anything in the daisy family or the carrot family. Um, and there's, um, there's a member of the carrot family right there that's dill. Um, they have a flower head that's like an upside down umbrella. And that is very attractive to insects. So if you grow dill as one of your herbs, you, you've got it covered right there. As far as the daisy family goes, um, a good one is um, marigolds because not only do they have, they have flowers that are attractive, but they also deter insects. We all know how nasty marigolds smell. Um, in addition, nasturtiums and certain herbs will also deter insects. And as you can see in this picture, um, somebody is kind of, put a border of um, marigolds around their garden. And it's, it's probably helping to, to um, make a lot of insects avoid that area. So, you know, that, that's really basic stuff on companion planting, um, but flowers, flowers are a good thing, annual flowers. Okay, now if you're planning on having any perennial crops in your garden, um, you need to kind of pay attention to the layout. A perennial crop is a crop that's going to live for more than three years. And it's probably gonna be pretty much permanent. It's gonna be like a tree. It's just gonna be there forever, um, you know, depending on the, the species, you know, 20, 30 years. As a result, you need to pay attention to where you're gonna put these perennial crops. Um, most, most of the vegetables that we grow are annuals. Um, there are a couple perennials. Does somebody uh, have a question? Excuse me? Go ahead. Cool. Okay, if you have a question, I'm not hearing you. So you can just type it in the chat. Um, so with perennial crops, you need to either place them off to the side of your garden or create a separate garden for them. That's because when you do your garden tasks, your tilling, your layout, um, you don't want to disturb them. And the typical perennial crops that we might grow up here would be horseradish, mint, asparagus, rhubarb, strawberries, and some perennial herbs like maybe thyme or oregano. Now, the reason there is an asterisk next to horseradish and mint is because both of those are extremely invasive. I would not put them in my vegetable garden because they will take over and you will regret it. So if you're gonna grow, you know, either one of those, well, the mint, you could, you could grow with the mint in a pot. That would be easy to do. Horseradish, like, like this picture here, put it in its own garden. And as you can see from this picture, this is in a location where they are mowing around the perimeter of this planting. If they didn't mow around it, this, the horseradish would just continue to spread. Think about a wheelbarrow. If you're gonna be using a wheelbarrow or a cart, um, just make sure that you have a main path, maybe down the center of the garden that um, is wide enough so you can push that wheelbarrow down through. Um, and then between the rows, you're probably gonna have you know, just narrow footpaths and they can be as little as one foot wide, just, just big enough so you can get in there and, and do your weeding and harvest. So let's talk a little bit about crop rotation. 
in subsequent years, you need to rotate your crops. Um, and this is a basic tenant of agriculture that's been lost. Um, as we've moved away from an agrarian society, um, we don't think about these things anymore. Now, back 100 years ago, this is something that everybody knew. You rotate your crops. Um, so, you know, nowadays we have to, we have to mention it. We have to remind people that you need to do this. Um, and basically what crop rotation does is um, it helps you be more successful as a garden gardener. You don't want to put the same crop in the same place year after year after year. You need to move things around. And the reason for that is, is because if you put something in the same spot over and over again, you're going to get a buildup of disease, you're going to get a buildup of possibly insects, and you're going to get a nutrient depletion taking place. Um, take tomatoes for an example. When tomatoes grow, there's a certain set of nutrients they take out of the soil. And if you put them in the same place year after year, they're going to come continue to, to, de to deplete those set of nutrients year after year until they are gone. Yes, hopefully you are putting in your organic matter and that's gonna help a little bit. But um, think of soil as, as a bank. And if you're growing certain crops in the same spot, you're constantly withdrawing and you, know, you may not be putting enough back in. And then the check bounces and then your crops don't do as well. Now, um, if you have a small area, a uh, small raised bed, it's going to be hard to rotate, but do the best you can because it, it'll save you a lot of headaches in the future. So um, any questions about crop rotation or garden layout? Okay, whoops. Okay, let's see here. Um, I'm just going to take a look at the chat here. Uh, okay, somebody mentions, you know, coffee grounds. Yes, they're fine. Yes, and the filter is fine. Um, someone says they're not seeing anything. If you're not seeing things, I guess the best thing would be to, is to, to get off and, and join back in. Um, everybody else um, seems to be seeing things. Someone says question marigolds. Um, I guess the question is what is a marigold maybe? Uh, a marigold is a small bedding plant. They're usually orange or brown or yellow in color, little short happy flowers. Um, you can buy them in most garden centers in the springtime. And marigolds um, have a very strong scent to them, um, almost what would be referred to as a skunky scent. It's not very pleasant, but they do deter insects. They're an annual bedding plant. Um, nasturtiums can be fed to animals. Yes. Um, I th yes, I think marigolds, I'm not, I think the petals might be edible, but nasturtium leaves and flowers are edible. Um, I, I usually grow nasturtiums in my garden every year and you can harvest the leaves and put them in salads and they have like a, like a peppery flavor to them. Okay, and that's what Dave just said. There we go. Um, are there things you can plant to have other creatures go away? <laughs> Deer, <laughs> uh, rodent type creatures. I'm gonna talk about this. Um, yeah, you just want to bribe them to get them out of there. I, I understand that. We're going to talk about critters a little bit later. Um, should there be some years for just a cover crop, such, such as buckwheat? Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Um, sometimes it's, you know, if you have the space, sometimes it's a good idea to just let certain areas remain fallow for a year, which means don't plant a crop in there, but plant a cover crop. So something like rye or buckwheat or clover, something like that will enhance the soil. You just let it grow for a season, usually cut it before it goes to seed. All that nutrient goes back into the soil. And that's an excellent thing to do. Um, you know, cover crops are, are always good. 
that's a whole nother program. Uh, but if you, if you want, if you're interested in that, just give me a call and we can, we can discuss that some more. Okay. Can I compost in a garden, in a raised bed garden with a bottom? Yes. Is winter rye meant to be grown or left over the winter and then tilled in the spring? Winter rye will usually, it usually dies back up here. So you, I, you, you shouldn't have to do um, anything. Just let it grow and it'll die back and then just till it in. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, get my computer going here. All right, let's talk real quickly about what to grow. And you know, this is kind of obvious, but what do you like? Um, if you have kids, a lot of times if kids grow their own vegetables, they will actually eat them. <laughs> and if you've never been exposed to fresh vegetables, they are completely different from canned vegetables and even from frozen vegetables. Frozen vegetables are pretty decent, but nothing beats a fresh vegetable. And a lot of people out there who don't like peas or don't like beets or don't like squash, it's because they've never had a fresh version of that. They, they've only had canned versions of it. So um, I would, I try to plant something different every year. And, and if there's something you don't like, try, try growing it and just see if, if um, having it in a fresh form changes your mind. Um, and try something new every year. Um, like I said, I've been gardening for almost 40 years and I'll try different things. You know, it might not be a different species, but it might be a different interesting variety of something. And sometimes these new things that I try are a great success and they become an annual addition to my garden. Sometimes they do lousy and I just don't grow them again. And of course, all of that is gonna depend on, on your, the conditions on your site. So, as beginners, I am going to encourage you to start with easy crops. I want you to be successful. I do not want to set you up for failure. So if you are a beginning gardener, start with some of these crops. Um, things you can grow from seed, greens. Greens are super easy, especially in containers. Um, nobody in this country should be without greens because you can just grow them in a small dish. Um, everybody should be eating a fresh salad every night because these are so simple to grow. Um, things like lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, and kale, super nutritious. Um, and, and when I say lettuce, I don't mean iceberg lettuce. Iceberg lettuce will not grow up here. Our growing season is not long enough. I mean leaf lettuce. I mean romaine lettuce. And think about if, if you like lettuce, especially romaine lettuce, think about what happens every summer. What happens? There's a scare. And it's always, it's always with the romaine lettuce um, that's been contaminated. Everybody throw out your romaine lettuce. Well, if you grow your own, you don't have to worry about that. Other easy crops to grow from seed are peas, beets, green beans, carrots and radishes, super easy to grow. Now I will give a word of warning on carrots. The seeds are very small. It's often difficult to space them two or three inches apart because the seeds are so small. Um, so, you know, basically if you just sprinkle them, um, that might be the, the easier thing to do. It, but if you do that, you have to thin them out. So once the carrots come up, you need to thin them so they're about two inches apart. Um, otherwise the roots will, will grow like this. Um, carrots are extremely slow to germinate. Don't give up on them. It will probably be two weeks before they come up. And when they first come up, they just look like a tiny piece of grass, very delicate. Um, and they grow extremely slowly. Um, so just be prepared for that. What a lot of people like to do is they like to interplant their rows of carrots with radishes because radishes are the, um, are a super fast crop. Good crop to grow if you want instant gratification. You put those radish seeds in, in four days they're up, you're harvesting radishes in 25 days. 
And if you do that, if you plant the radishes in with the carrots, um, you'll, ha you'll have those radishes harvested before the carrots are probably an inch tall. That's how slow, slowly carrots grow. Now, if you're gonna be growing things from transplants, um, tomatoes, hot or frying peppers do well. Um, zucchini is really easy to grow and you can grow it from seed also as are cucumbers and they can be planted from seed also. Now you may wonder why I'm not saying, you know, bell peppers, green peppers, why, why don't you have those up there? They just don't seem to do really well. They like a lot of heat. I mean, you'll get, you'll get a decent crop off of them. Um, but if you plant hot peppers or the frying peppers, like the Cubanelle type peppers or the Italian frying peppers, they just tend to be much more prolific. And sometimes you want to grow, you know, things that, you know, are expensive in the store or maybe difficult to obtain. Um, sometimes the garlic that's, that you find in the stores are these heads of garlic. And when you separate them, you get these little tiny cloves and you're trying to take the skins off of those. If you grow your own garlic, you can grow that nice big thumb-sized clove. Um, leeks can be expensive. Um, there are some herbs that you might not be able to find in the store. And if you do a lot of ethnic cooking, there are a lot of ethnic vegetables that we can grow up here that might not be read readily available in grocery stores. Um, if you're... If your interest is in nutrition, increasing your nutrition, um, these, these particular crops tend to be um, very high in nutrition. Um, some of them are more difficult to grow than others, but um, kale, um, peppers, and carrots, those, those three are relatively easy to grow. Now, I just want to, you know, put this out there that if you are a beginner, there are some things that you should avoid. Um, because they're, they're very difficult to grow and, um, you know, just wait a couple of years until you have more experience. But um, these are the things that I don't recommend for beginners. Broccoli, cauliflower, watermelon, cantaloupe, honeydew, and celery. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why these are difficult to grow. A lot of it has, has to do with the perfect timing of planting. Um, some of them just require a lot of heat or a lot of water. So this is just an FYI to you. Um, so um, any questions about, you know, what to grow? Let's see what the chat says here. Um, I got to get back to the beginning. Well, you guys have got a lot of questions. Okay, I think we're back here. Um, the ratio of flowering plants to vegetables. You know, if, if you're going to put, you know, some nasturtiums or marigolds in your garden, uh, now you're just, just put a few here and there, you know, four or five feet apart in clumps. You know, you don't have to, it's, it's not a 50-50 ratio. I, I don't even know if there is a ratio. Um, but just, you know, some people like put a few on each corner or, you know, at the end of each row, something like that is really all you need. Um, yard by Yard in Chameau has mushroom compost bulk. Um, great. Thank you to Dana for, for that information. That's great information. Um, can you grow greens through the winter in New York? Yes, you could grow them indoors. Um, you would have to have supplemental light, but it would probably work. Um, a couple of years ago, I grew lettuce in my basement through the winter. Um, obviously, you're not going to get a lot, you know, because unless you have a large container and lots of light to put on it. But, um, you know, just it's really going to depend on how much space you have. But the key is, is you're going to need supplemental light. You can't do this in a southern facing window. It, the light, um, the sun is out, not out long enough in the winter and it's not bright enough in the winter. Um, I think they make pot varieties, the peas started. Okay, 
Yes. Um, someone states the peas that they started this year are a patio version. So you can keep them in pots. So you would grow them through the winter in a greenhouse or inside with lights. Yes, if you're lucky enough to have a greenhouse um, that has heat, that, that's an option too. Um, okay, here's someone who's um, growing greens on their south window. So good, I'm glad it's working for you because for most people it doesn't work because their days just aren't long enough. Um, and uh, Amanda says she grows a year's worth of garlic um, yes, and garlic is a little bit different. I did, haven't mentioned garlic because garlic you have to plant usually the end of October into November, and then you harvest it the following July. So it's, it's kind of a different one, but it's, it's easy to grow. Is there anybody nearby that sells heirloom seeds? Oh boy. Um, I mean, most garden centers, if, if you go in there and look at their seeds, It'll, they'll have, it'll, they'll, there'll be a banner on the packet that says heirloom, you know, because they're, they're pushing that. Um, the other thing to do would be to just get some seed catalogs. Um, most seed companies sell heirloom seeds. Um, as far as anybody nearby, you could buy directly from, you know, that would, I don't know. You'd probably just have to ask around. Um, what kinds of ethnic vegetables can you grow up here? Well, it depends on what kinds you're talking about. There's a lot of Chinese vegetables that you can grow, um, bok choy, um, the, the, um, the peas, the pea shoots, and I'm probably not using the correct name. I, I know there is a name for them. You can grow those. You can grow um, the Chinese broccoli. Um, and I can't think of the name of that either. My son-in-law is Chinese and if he was here, he would tell me all these names, but um, those things you can grow. Um, there are certain type of um, peppers that are used um, in, in Latin American cooking. You know, um, there's a specific pepper for, for various dishes, whether it's a poblano or a cayenne. Most of those hot peppers can be grown up here. Um, let's see. I didn't realize how lucky I was to get watermelon that, yes. <laughs> watermelon is super hard to grow because it likes a lot of heat and it likes a lot of water. And a lot of times up here, you know, even though we're all complaining about how hot it is, you know, during certain summers, it's still not hot enough for watermelon. So um, yes, you, you got lucky. Issues with new zucchini. Awful worm attacks. Okay, we'll, we'll, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk real briefly about um, insect problem. Brussels sprouts, um, that's kind of a weird one. Uh, again, you, you plant transplants in July and you let the plants grow past the first frost because the frost won't bother them. And you harvest the actual sprouts once they've been frosted because they taste much better. They become a lot sweeter. Organic bug control, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, yes, cauliflower um, is a problem, but yeah, but it sounds like you have a greenhouse, so good, so, so you have a lot more options. Any pumpkin tips? <laughs> um, for a lot of these, you need to call me because we don't have a lot of time to go into, um, to go into the specifics. Spider deterrent, um, actually spiders are beneficial. So we don't recommend that people kill spiders because they are, they'll go after a lot of um, potential plant um, pests. So we, so we don't recommend um, spider deterrents. Where do you find garlic and leeks? Uh, most garden catalogs will have them. If you want names, let me know. Um, sweet potatoes seem intimidating. I've grown sweet potatoes before. Um, you need to get varieties that are um, good for Northern New York. So shorter season varieties. Um, you're not gonna get a huge crop, but they're fun, they're fun to grow. Um, okay, somebody's saying that um, they had good luck with broccoli. Yeah, broccoli is a cool season crop. So, so it likes those cold temperatures. Um, seems like the only thing my garden is green beans and okra. Could this be a soil issue? That I would have to discuss with you, ask more questions. Sweet corn, you're going to get my diatribe on sweet corn shortly. 
Um, okay, and just some tips on things here. Hudson Valley Seed Company, yes, that's a good place to go. Um, they're out of New York State, so you're getting very uh, local, local seeds. Um, okay. Let's see, cheap, somebody's put up a cheap greenhouse, $160 for eight by 15. Uh, giant pumpkins, yeah, that's, that's a fun one to, to do. Okay, so let's, um, in the interest of time, let's move on here and talk about where you're gonna get your seeds and plants. And that, this is a question that's come up a couple of times in the chat. Um, when you go to buy seeds, um, there's a lot of different places you can buy seeds. You can go to your local hardware store. You can go to big box stores. Um, you can you can go online. You can go through catalogs. But um, there are different types of seeds, and I just want to talk about the differences between them. There are just regular seeds, and it doesn't say regular seeds on the label, but um, they're just seeds that you know they're just seeds. They are, there's nothing that distinguishes them from other types of seeds. And they tend to be, you know, the common seeds that we see in most garden centers, um, usually are a little bit cheaper. Then you have seeds that, that are labeled organic. And if you are a, a true organic gardener, um, you would want to purchase organic seeds. And they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Um, what makes organic seeds special is that they are harvested from plants that were not treated with chemicals or pesticides. Then we have what are called non-GMO seeds and these GMO is a genetically modified organism and um, most of the seeds that you purchase are going to be non-GMO. If it's a GMO seed um, that's been you know fooled around with gen genetically it's going to say that on the label. Hybrid seeds are the result of two parents being crossed and the resulting offspring are hybrids. They have certain characteristics from each parent, usually beneficial characteristics. Um, you cannot save the seeds from hybrid plants. So if you grow a hybrid tomato, you cannot save those seeds and plant them next year. You'll get a tomato plant, but it won't be the same plant. It'll be combination, you know, some weird combination of the parents, which may not be very good. Um, open pollinated seeds are popular because you can save the seeds from these. Since they aren't hybrids, they will come true from seed. And then you have the heirloom seeds. And heirloom seeds are varieties that have been passed down, you know, hundreds of, well, not maybe hundreds, maybe a hundred years. They've been passed down usually through families, generation to generation. And um, they have certain, you know, aspects that are, that are beneficial, um, you know, as far as there's a lot of heirloom tomatoes um, that may be good for sauce, things like that. Um, all heirloom seeds are open pollinated, which means you can save the seeds, but not all open pollinated seeds are heirlooms. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, you know, you can get catalogs, you know, here, you know, the picture on the right, you know, Johnny's, Burpees, you know, Territorial, there, there are all these seed companies out there. And none is, is any better than any other one. I tend to stay with seed companies where the seeds are produced in the Northeast. Um, and Johnny's is one of them. Those, those seeds come out of Maine. Um, the Hudson Valley Seed Company, that's another one that, that's in the Hudson Valley. So you're getting local seeds, and the idea is that the more local the seeds, the more inherent, inherent, um, inherently hardy they're going to be to the area because they were developed in this area. Um, territorial seeds, I believe they're out of Oregon. I've never ordered from them because I figure, you know, Oregon is totally different from the Northeast. So that's kind of the thinking about that. Um, if you go through catalogs or go online, you can get just about anything. Um, if you depend on stores for your seeds, you're going to be at their mercy, you know, what, what varieties they have. Um, somebody mentioned about local seeds. The DePoeville Library, right outside of Clayton, 
has a seed exchange. You can go in and they have a card catalog type setup where you can um, exchange seeds. And I, I would have, um, I have a pretty good idea that there are a lot of heirloom seeds included in that. And in general, the cheaper the seed, the less the quality control. Um, now I'm not saying you need to go out and buy the most expensive seeds out there, but just beware of you know, those 10 for a dollar type seeds that you see sometimes in hardware stores. A lot of times you're not necessarily gonna get what you see on the label. You, know, you may get a tomato, but it's not gonna be you know, the best tomato. So, um, so that, that's just an FYI. Okay, so, um, you know, as far, and I should say, as far as seeds go, you know, how do you plant them? R that information is right on the seed packet. It's going to tell you um, how deep to plant them. It will tell you how far apart to space the seeds, whether you should thin them. It will tell you how far apart to place the rows. So keep those seed packets. They, a lot of times they have a lot of good information on them. And I always keep mine through the end of the season, just in case I need to refer to anything, um, have questions about it. Um, it. Some of these catalogs have a lot of excellent information in them. Johnny's catalog, it'll write in the catalog, it'll tell you exactly how to grow these crops, a, a lot of good information. And another thing is when you plant your seeds, um, you should mark your rows, get some sort of stake, popsicle stick, piece of, you know, I've seen people use plastic spoons and just label those rows at the beginning and the end so that when your seeds do come up, you can actually find them. You know, in general, if you look in that area, you know, you'll see a pattern of a straight line of things coming up. That way it's just to tell the, um, the weeds from the seeds. Okay, so um, sometimes we can't, plant seeds. And we need to transplant actual plants into the garden. And this happens with tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, herbs. So those are the main ones, but there are some other ones too. And the reason we can't just put a tomato plant in the ground is because by the time the ground got warm enough and that tomato seed came up and germinated and grew, the frost would kill it before you even got any tomatoes. And that's why we use transplants because it kind of gives us a little shortcut. Um, Dad, I wish I had a fast forward on this lecture. Does somebody have a question? Okay, I'm, I'm getting some background noise. So, so please make sure you're muted. And of course, if you do have a question, just unmute yourself and, and go right ahead. I have a quick one. Yes. Okay, when you were talking about seeds, so many times you end up with leftover seeds and they've gone past their expiration date. Um, do you throw them away or can you still give them a shot or what is the likelihood they'll even work? Okay, that's an excellent question and thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, don't throw them out. Seeds, depending on the variety, can be viable for three, four, five years. And, um, you know, some of them, they, they may not have as high of a germination rate. So you may need to plant them a little bit thicker than you normally would. And that's just a guessing game. Um, but, um, I mean, one of, one of the ones that doesn't really do well from year to year is corn. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother trying to save corn seeds. But everything else you know, two, three years. And, and if you want specifics on, you know, if that little package of green beans is still good when it's from 2017, just get online. There are all kinds of charts that tell, you know, in general, how long seeds are viable for. Um, this year, as I was planning my garden in December, I went through my box of seeds that I have on hand and realized that I didn't need to buy anything because I had stuff left over from last year. So my entire garden this year is going to be of leftover seeds. And I, that's not the first time I've done it and it's fine. So don't throw those seeds out. You know, that, 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 that expiration date is just an FYI. Yes, if you've got seeds that are 10 years old, throw them out, but look at a chart first because you might be surprised. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, so where do you get your transplant um, seeds? Garden shops, big box stores, um, everybody's got them, you know, in the spring. Um, you can start your own. I don't recommend this for beginners. It's, there's a lot of work involved, a lot of things you need to pay attention to. Um, a lot of people do it. But if you are a beginner, just save yourself some headaches and go to the local Walmart and, and buy, and buy your, your uh, transplants. Um, starting seeds indoors is a whole nother two hour program. Okay. So any questions on seeds and plants? Okay, let's see. All right, I'm just trying to get back to where we left off here. Um, okay, someone wants to know how do you utilize a seed library? It's, it's just like, um, it's just, just like when you borrow a book, you know, they, they, you, they give you the seeds and then at the end of the year, you, you save a portion of those seeds and return them back to the library. That's probably the easiest way to explain it. Um, yes, great source for, uh, heritage, Native American, open pollinated corn varieties, seedsavers.org. Yep. A lot of interest in, um, Three Sisters Gardens, corn beans and squash. And a lot of people do like to um, use um, heritage or heirloom seeds when they do those types of plantings. Um, Potsdam Library has a seed program, but they're, uh, they're currently closed. So maybe as things improve with COVID, maybe that'll open up. Okay, can you use seeds that have expired? I guess we talked about that. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's move on to, I think, is what's going to be our, our last section here. Bring a little bit more clarity to things. In northern New York, we grow two types of vegetable garden crops. We grow, grow cool season crops and warm season crops. And I want to talk about um, both of these. So cool season crops are crops that we plant from seed include lettuce, spinach, kale, peas, beets, carrots, radish, onion sets, or plants. Um, don't try to plant onion seeds outside. Those are something that you have to start indoors. Um, onions take forever. I'm still getting some background noise. Um, I'm hearing voices and crunching sounds. So if you could please mute your microphone, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, cool season crops love the cold weather. Um, you can plant these as early as mid-April. As long as that ground is able to be worked, you can put these right in the ground. They love it. A lot of these will germinate at temperatures as low as 40 degrees. And when I talk about temperature, I'm talking about soil temperature. As low as 40 degrees. Um, they laugh at the cold. Um, Cold and frost does not bother them. They can get snowed on. They don't care. Um, so these are the early season or cool crops. Now with things like lettuce and spinach and peas, they're gonna grow in, in the beginning of the season, they're gonna grow, they're gonna do their thing and they're gonna go to seed because they, they disdain hot weather. And once you get into July, it's just too hot. They don't like it and they go to seed. Um, the good thing is, is you can replant them in late August and you can then have a fall crop of those, of those same things. So any of these, lettuce, spinach, kale, peas, beets, not carrots, but radish, they all can be planted as a fall crop. And then we have what we call the warm season crops. Um, and some of these are grown from seed approximately May 15th, but you're gonna to need to pay attention to the weather. When gardening, you can never go by calendar dates. You really have to look at the conditions. So from seed, mid to late May, um, you can put in green beans, cucumbers, zucchinis, and winter squash. 
Now, corn is a warm season crop. And I always get questions on corn. Everybody wants to grow corn. Here are my thoughts on corn. Um, unless you have an area that is at least 20 by 20, that you can plant with corn, the entire thing, 20 by 20 area, it's not worth planting corn. Corn takes up a lot of space. It needs to cross pollinate. So if you don't put a big enough block in, you won't get cross pollination and you won't get ears or you'll get little ears that, that aren't filled out. Um, corn is very greedy. It takes a lot of fertilizer. Um, and as far as the bang for the buck nutritionally that you get from corn, there are a lot of much better options besides corn. So what I tell people, unless you've got a large area you can plant, don't even bother. Because if you've lived up here in the North Country for a while, you know that starting end of July into August, there is a corn stand on every single corner. And it's easier just to go down to the corn man and, and buy your corn. And that, that's my own humble opinion on corn. Um, if uh, most of our transplants are what are called warm season crops also, and these cannot be set out in the ground until late May um, and sometimes early June. So things like tomato, peppers, cucumbers, zucchini, winter squash. If you're using these as transplants, which for uh, tomatoes and peppers, you have to. Um, you cannot put those transplants out until the end of May. And usually up here in Northern New York, most people shoot for Memorial Day weekend. That's when everybody tends to put their, their plants out. And some years it's fine, um, but other years, for, and last year was an example, it was a good example. It never really got warm until early June. And if you had planted some of those transplants out um, in late May, it really pushed them back. It will slow them down. Um, there is no rush to get these in. If it's the first week in June, you haven't gotten them in yet, that is fine. Don't worry about it because you're not gonna be any farther ahead. Um, a lot of times for people, it's a race to get that first tomato. And if you put them out too early, when it's too cold, you're just gonna set them back and you're no further ahead. These plants are very sensitive to cold temperatures. It doesn't have to be below freezing. It can just be 50 degrees with a cool breeze. We'll kill these plants. So that's why you'll see on seed packets or or you'll read in a book, it'll say set out after all danger of frost has passed. And usually by the end of the May, we're, we're in that area. Now that's why you need to know your spring and fall frost dates. And again, these are averages. You cannot say, oh, it's May 30th, time to plant the tomatoes. You really need to pay attention to the weather conditions. Um, as you can see on this map here, you know, if you're all in New York State, you can kind of look at your area to see. But here in Jefferson County, generally, for the majority of the county, our last spring frost date is April 30th to May 10th. And we usually wait a couple more weeks until Memorial Day before we put those plants out. Um, if you live in, you know, the far south eastern portion of the county, it's going to be maybe end of May before we, before that last frost occurs. And then you need to pay attention to the first fall frost because this is going to determine, um, you know, what kind of crops you can grow. In general, in northern New York, you should shoot for crops that are going to mature within about 120 days. Don't go beyond that because you probably will not get a crop. The frost will kill it. And as you can see, um, the majority of Jefferson County, we get our first fall frost, usually between September 30th and October 10th. Again, you need to pay attention to the weather. If they call for a frost and you've still got fruit on the vines, you can, you can go harvest that. And some of it you can ripen inside or you can, you know, green tomatoes, you can make into relish. Um, there, there, there are options. But once they get frosted, your, your options are over with. You can't do anything with them. 
Okay. So now let's move on about water, talk about irrigation. Um, there's a basic rule of thumb in gardening. Most vegetable gardens need an inch of water per week. The best way to determine this is to use a rain gauge and you can buy one at your local hardware store for about $10. Um, if after a week you don't have an inch of water in that gauge, irrigate your plants. You should always water early in the day before 10 o'clock. And the reason for this is, is we don't want to get the leaves wet. Um, yes, when it rains, everything gets wet. But if you're constantly watering after dinner, seven, eight o'clock at night, and then the plants go into that humid period of the evening, they're gonna stay wet all night. And that encourages a lot of disease. If you water early in the day, that gives the plant leaves a chance to dry out. Now, if you're using drip irrigation, the leaves aren't getting wet. It's not that much of a concern. Um, but if you're using a sprinkler system, you really need to make sure you do it before 10 o'clock. And you wanna avoid, um, if you're watering by hand or with a sprinkler, avoid a light sprinkling. You want to um, give the plants a deep watering so that the water penetrates down into the soil. Um, a deep watering is much better than frequent light sprinkles. When you just give a few sprinkles, that encourages the, uh, the roots to stay near the soil surface. And when they're really close to the soil surface like that, they aren't as protected. Um, and if you do get a drought period, guess what's gonna dry out first? That top portion of the soil. So you wanna encourage deep rooting and the way to do that is with deep waterings. Weeds. Weeds are the bane of most gardeners. And the bottom line is um, you need to make it a daily chore, especially early in the season. Um, the, the better you keep up on weeds early in the season, um, the more success you're going to have. As the season goes on, you'll have to do less weeding but it's something that you need to be doing every day. And you should be out in the garden every day anyway, you know, just looking for, you know, just seeing what's happening and making sure there are no problems developing. Now, mulch can go a long way to limit the amount of weeding you have to do. So absolutely use mulch. Um, you can put it around the plants in a long rows. You can, um, you can, you can use the bag mulch that you buy at garden centers. You can use leaves or grass clippings, straw, not hay. Hay contains a lot of weed seeds, so avoid that. You can use cardboard and noose newspaper. You can even buy rolls of uh, plastic mulch that you can put down. Um, don't allow any weeds to go to seed because there's, there's your seeds for next year. Um, some crops, like those greens that we talked about earlier, if you plant them very densely, um, that's natural shade and it will block out some of the weeds. But the bottom line is, is you're going to have to do some hand weeding. Um, you never want to pile uh, mulch or any type of uh, material against the plant stems because it will cause them to rot. So the area is immediately around the stems where they go down into the ground, you're gonna to have to weed by hand. So you need to have a plan, uh, make it a daily chore. And weeding is one of the biggest reasons why people give up on their gardens because the weeds come up, they don't pay attention to them. And then they get so big that they're almost impossible to pull out. Weeds are very easy to pull when they are small. Um, and a lot of people, they just give up because they can't keep up with the weeding. So I, I have no magical thing to get rid of weeds. That's one of the things related to gardening that you just have to you know, get in your mind that you're gonna to have to do. So let's talk a little bit about fertilization. You know, hopefully you're adding organic matter. And that's gonna give you some amount of nutrients. Um, there are different types of fertilizers, organic fertilizers and fertilizers that are not organic. Um, organic fertilizers are things that we've talked about. Um, 
cow manure, horse manure, anything that was once living, basically. Um, the benefits of organic fertilizers um, are that they, they tend to, even though they have low nutrient amounts, they also are a soil conditioner. They will help improve your soil, whether it's a sandy soil or clay soil. Um, and they have those beneficial micronutrients in them. So, so th those are the, um, the benefits of organic fertilizers. You're not gonna get a lot of high nutrients, but you're gonna get soil enhancement. And a um, couple of organics, um, fish emulsion is, um, it's a soluble fertilizer. Um, you can water the plants with it and they'll take it in through their leaves or through their roots and you usually have to do it every two weeks. Um, a product that's not organic would be a synthetic fertilizer. It's something that we have created. Um, Osmocote um, is a sort of like a little pellet that you can add to the garden. You do one application when you prep your soil and it feeds the whole season. You really never have to think about it again. So if you do the asthma coat along with organic matter, you're good to go for the whole season. Um, or you can do a water soluble chemical fertilizer like miracle Grow. That needs to be applied every two weeks. Um, and you know, it just, just, just depends on, you know, personally how you feel about chemicals versus natural products and how much work you wanna do. Um, you know, these soluble fertilizers that you have to feed every two weeks, you know, you've got to kind of keep track of that. Um, if you are, have added any bagged garden soil to your garden, to make sure you pay attention to whether or not that contains fertilizers, because nowadays it's almost impossible to find any type of garden soil that doesn't have fertilizer in it. And if you've added that to your garden, you don't need to add osmocote or, or anything else other than the organic matter, because then you're, if you do, you're gonna get um, problems with nutrient overload. And again, we talked about that earlier. Okay, and when you put those transplants in, it's a good idea to water them after you get them in the ground with one of those water soluble fertilizers. Fish emulsion or miracle Grow is just a one-time thing. And basically what that does, it kind of gives them a boost um, to get them going. And here's just some pictures, Osmocote. These are those little beads that you often see in soil. miracle Grow. you mix it with water as, um, as you do with um, uh, fish fertilizer, fish emulsion. Um, just an FYI, this stuff smells really bad. It's basically... Um, the uh, the re the uh, the spoils of the fishing industry, the parts that they don't use, they grind them up, and that's what that's what fish emulsion is. A little bit about um, critter control. I'm not going to go go into a lot of detail because this again is another entire college semester <laughs> of um, of study, but. Um, you know, you really need to have a plan. If you are in a location where deer are already coming into your, your yard, if they are already frequenting your yard and you put vegetables in, they are going to destroy the vegetables. Really, the only 100% thing to keep deer out is an eight foot high fence. And let's face it, that's expensive and most of us don't want that in our yard. Um, there are some things you can do to deter deer. A product called Liquid Fence works really well. It smells like rotten eggs, and that is the product that is most offensive to deer. Um, if you have a small garden, you can put a, a low chicken wire fence around it, and that will keep them out. Even though they can step right over it, they, they, they don't like going into a confined area. Um, things like rodents, squirrels, chipmunks, the, about the only thing you can do is to trap them because they can climb and they can get into anything. Um, woodchucks and rabbits, um, if you put up a fence and you bury the lower portion of the fence, buried about eight or 10 inches, um, that way they can't go under it. Um, birds, birds don't usually bother gardens too much, but if you do have fruit 
um, it might be an issue and you need to get some netting to put over the fruit when it's ripe to keep the birds away. Um, cats, if you have feral cats or you just have a neighborhood cat that's outdoors, um, cats believe that in every garden is their own personal litter box and they will use it as such. And obviously you don't want cat poop in your garden. Um, there are granular repellents you can buy. Um, there's also a, an interesting product that I've seen. There are spikes. It's like a mat, plastic mat that you lay out and it has plastic spikes that stick up on it. And you can lay these mats out in the garden and the spikes are not sharp. They're not going to hurt the cat. But if the cat goes in there, it's not going to like walking on those spikes. So that, that's a, a deterrent tool. Um, really quickly, diseases and in insects. If you have a problem, contact your local cooperative extension. Um, correct ID is very important. Um, just because there is an insect on your plant doesn't mean it's creating a problem. Just because there's an insect on your plant next to a damage area doesn't mean that insect did it. Um, you can bring in samples to our office. You can email me photos. And a lot of times we can give you an option for control that's organic, or maybe you don't want an organic option. Maybe you just want that problem gone and we can, we can tell you what, what kind of pesticide to spray on it. Um, don't, what, what I would, what I would rec recommend that you not do is don't get online and try to figure out what type of insect it is or figure out what type of disease it is. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, the internet is, has a lot of bad information on it. Um, and this is the beauty of the Cooperative Extension Service. No matter where you are in the United States, there will be a Cooperative Extension Office in your county and we are there to help you. We want you to be successful. We are not trying to sell you anything. We are giving you research-based information for free. If you get online um, and you go to, you know, these some of these places, they're either trying to sell you something or it's just somebody's own personal experience, which is based on nothing. So use your extension service. If you see anything you think is weird, contact us and we will help you out with that. Um, harvest, you know, ripeness is important. And a lot of times you can't go by the ripeness of vegetables in grocery stores because a lot of times they're, they're um, picked when they're overripe or not ripe enough. So it's just something that you learn over time. And if you end up being very successful, which most first time gardeners are, they have really great gardens their first year, um, have a plan for you know, what you're gonna do with those extras, whether it's the local food pantry, your neighbors, or you're gonna do some canning or freezing. At the end of the season, you need to clean up that garden, remove all your plant material and debris, get it out of there. If you're adding fresh manure or leaves, you need to till your garden now. Um, but again, only till once a year, either in the spring or the fall. Now I wanna direct you to the Cornell Gardening site. Um, just go to that website, go to Garden Guidance, Food Gardening, and you can bring up what are called vegetable growing guides. They are going to um, tell you everything you need to know about growing very specific crops. Any, any crop that you might wanna grow in a vegetable garden is gonna be on there. Um, we also, at Cooperative Extension here in Jefferson County, we also created a food gardening packet last year um, because of the COVID situation and the interest in gardening. Um, you can find that food gardening packet online and it basically goes through everything I've talked about today and probably goes in, into a little bit more detail. I think it's like a 20 page um, packet. It's lots of charts and graphs, approximate planting dates, things like that. And again, if you have questions, that's my email. And I just want to point out, it's S-J-G. A lot of people interpret that as an I. If it's an I, I won't get it. Um, and that's my phone number at the office. And um, let's see, we've probably got a couple more minutes. I have, we have to do our little drawing here. Um, anybody have any questions on anything?
Okay. I'm going to uh, just look through. Uh, Ma'am? Yes. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you guys are going to offer something like a hydroponics class or maybe a more intensive um, uh, like container. Okay, I didn't, I didn't hear that. How, how to do what? Uh, like a hydroponics class. Oh, hydroponics. Like yes, ma'am. Um, we haven't offered anything like that. Um, you know, now that I, and I know there's a lot of interest in it, you know, that might be something we would do in the future, but, um, in the 20 years that I've been there, we, we haven't done anything on that, but I'm glad to know there's interest out there and that's in the back of my mind now. Yes, ma'am. We just, we live in the city of Watertown where uh, military and, um, there is just, there's, we have a very limited um, yard, so. We were just wondering if you guys had any information or if there was a, a site that you perhaps would suggest. Yeah, um, again, I would say call me at the office and I can hook you up with, with some more information on that. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, um, so just a few tips here. Um, Lafarge Villagua is family owned and they have lots of starter transplants. Um, yeah, no spring last year. And that seems to be the trend that um, we, we go basically from what you see out there now to 80 degrees. And that, that really can create some problems. Um, the Farmer's Almanac website, they have the first and, first and average frost dates. Yes, you can just type in your address. Um, yes. Um, yeah, a lot of people ended up with a lot of tomatoes last year that didn't ripen. So there, there's a lot of uh, tomato relish out there. Uh, let's see. And if I'm, I'm just going through these really quickly. If I am not answering your questions or addressing them, please give me a call. Um, I'm in the office next week. We're on a COVID schedule, but next week is my week to be in the office. So I will be there to answer your calls. Um, Somebody is bribing the neighborhood cats with catnip. That's a good idea. Cucumber beetles are a huge problem. And the reason for that is, is because even if you wanted to use a pesticide, most of the pesticides don't work anymore um, because we've overused them and the insects are resistant to that. Um, huge problem, contact me about that. You gotta use a lot of different strategies. Uh, Japanese beetles, yes, they were bad last year. L last year was a bad year. Um, should tomato and leafy vegetable plants be pruned when they get very bushy? Um, depends on what type you're growing. So give me a call on this. Some tomatoes need to be pruned, some don't. Um, do you put liquid fence around the border, inside or outside the garden? Usually around the border. A um, couple feet away so that so 